right, Scott, um, it's a pleasure to have you here. I just want you to tell us, uh, basically, not me and Julian, but everyone that is listening uh, on YouTube or whatever they're going to listen to this. Uh, who are you? Uh, what you do in general? And, and why are you here today with us? So we can just start from there. Who's Scott Johnson? So uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Scott Johnson. Uh, I work as an MRI technologist in Boston. I work in a full-time right now in a cardiac MRI a research lab where half clinical and half research and i'm here today i guess because i've had a pretty roundabout journey into mri i think as as many of us have i just took kind of a longer detour so i guess way back in the day uh like a lot of us i started off in x-ray i went to school in boston got my degree in radiography graduated in 2012 and the job market was pretty tight we had a class of like eight and I didn't get a job out of school. Like most of my classmates didn't get jobs and they ended up moving out of state. I ended up moving back in with my parents. That was super cool. Um, so I had about seven months of waiting and I would have done anything for a job. I think I would find a like wine shop and then I got denied that. They were like, oh, you've got a bachelor's degree, right? I want to work at a wine shop. Um, and it just by happenstance, my old clinical coordinator had um, a clinical site. There was an animal hospital that had just switched from film x-ray to digital. And they were looking for a human trained technologist that's familiar with digital radiography. So I said, yeah, absolutely. I'll totally do that. And I accepted a temporary position, which turned into like 10 years, basically, uh, working at the animal hospital. That's super cool. It, it's funny to to that you graduated same same year that I did, and I had I didn't have the exact same way, but I graduated in 2012 as well. 11, 11, I think it was 11, and I also didn't have any jobs in Portugal. I probably Julian went through the same thing. Yes, so, same identical thing, but just a couple <laughs> of years later. <laughs> yeah, so we didn't have market. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was no jobs in Portugal back then, so I was working in a sports clothes, um, in a clothes shop. So I was making bikes building the bikes together and folding clothes sports clothes and stuff like that uh, so it's funny to see there's more people that were struggling on the other side of the world with exactly the same problem um but I, I would like to touch on that point that you started as a vet radiographer uh, you were saying basically yeah yeah so i started just as a veterinary radiographer just doing x-rays and after having done three years you know of an accelerated program doing x-rays thinking I knew a lot about x-rays. The first day, I think I x-rayed a pregnant chihuahua for a condition called dystocia, wow. where like it's in the process of giving birth, but one of the babies is stuck and I'm in lead. I have lead gloves on and I'm holding the chihuahua on an x-ray plate, at, you know, doing x-rays. I'm like, wow, what did I get myself into? Um, but from that point, because in veterinary medicine, there's way fewer restrictions on what you can do so it's kind of i imagine the way medicine was maybe 15 20 30 years ago so i learned on the job how to run cts how to get really proficient in x-rays i learned mr on the job and anyone in the department could do any of those things and most people didn't have any radiology background to start with at all we were all kind of a collection of misfits i guess um and I think there's really pluses and minuses to that, too, because we worked together as a really solid team and everybody knew a little bit of everything. And we all had to work with really old equipment. So we were really open about sharing knowledge. We were really in tune to how the equipment worked because it was really, really old. Um, so it, it made in some ways it made you know a little bit more about it. In, in terms of the, the MRI scanners you were using, was something like we're using nowadays, like an open scanner or, or uh, 1.5 scanners? What kind of scanners you had and how did you learn those things by yourself? Because you're saying kind of autodidact that that's what you were doing, right? You were learning on the go. Um, how was that experience? Yeah, that was a great, in hindsight, it was a crazy experience. Um, the scanner that we had was far and away nothing like we scan on today. Uh, even nothing like we were scanning on probably in the early 2000s. Um, let me see. I might have a picture I can share with you. Yeah, I think you send me that picture. I'll, I'll share that picture. Just give me right. one second and I'll try to find it. Um, let me get it. 
Wow, well, now now I expect something of Lily, you know, like <laughs> a bunker. <laughs> so the, so just so you can kind of build it in your imagination, the picture that uh, this in your head, it's a 1.5 Tesla scanner. Okay, it, so it was a already quite high field anyway. It was it was high field. It was not actively shielded. So there is, oh, there you go. There, there, it, is. Is. Yeah, there it is. So it's not actively wow. shielded. That's There's good. a Faraday cage <laughs> on the front. It's closed in the back. And instead of having like clearly demarcated zone three, zone four, zone two, there was like some bay doors in the back of the room, a door for the tech, but just one big open room and then the scanner. And um, if you look to the back of the left picture, back of the back left of the picture where the fan is, that's where the scanning console was located. I'm quite so, surprised though, but you decided that this is 1.5. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, it seems there is quite a lot of electromagn like, kind of like ferromagnetic material in the <laughs> equipment. And the, exactly. and the console is right there, right? Without yeah. any protection, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean that was probably like 15, 15, 20 feet. But uh, it was pretty loud. The scanner was so old and kind of by the end of its life, by the time I started to learn on it. So each sequence took about 25 minutes. Wow. So if you were going to do a uh, dog spine, you're like, you're starting at, eight, at like 8 to 9 a.m. You wave goodbye to everybody and you leave for about eight hours. Jeez. You're going to do a contract. 20, 20, 25 minutes with deep learning, I would assume, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was doing all the deep learning up here. The whole time. <laughs> there is nothing so to this day, nothing so nerve wracking as like starting a flare on a brain and it's 28 minutes and you've got the dog in there. You're like, don't don't wake up. Don't wake up. Don't wake up. We don't want to repeat this. Don't want to repeat this. Um, they were always fully sedated. Yeah. Under yeah. anesthesia, yeah. So on the bottom left, you can see some of the anesthesia equipment. And that anesthesia equipment is MR safe. It's just very old school. That's also really common to see in a lot of other places. Um, I'm still mesmerized with the fact that the control area is right there. Yeah, me too. Yeah. It's literally nothing yeah. between you and the scanner. Yeah, we had earplugs. And you really got to know the anesthesia tech that you were working with. Because you had uh, eight I hours to sit and talk. How would you move uh, your patients? They're animals, of course, but how would you move them on that scanner? How do you transport them? Can you tell us a little bit about the workflow that you have here? Because it seems completely different than what we do nowadays on human side and vet side as well. So it's kind of interesting to understand how you would do it. Yeah, so this whole thing's kind of kind of a relic, even in veterinary medicine now. this is You wouldn't find this anywhere. This is a, a snapshot to a once-in-a-lifetime happenstance the usual workflow is every every scan you do is an anesthesia case the dogs will usually get sedated usually in zone three you know in in whatever location on this particular scanner there's no automatic table so we had a v trough shaped coil we would lay the dog on the coil and then palpate where we wanted to center and there was two side by side rulers and you would measure out Oh, I want, you know, 30 centimeters to the to ISO center and push it in manually, 30 centimeters, it's, put the Faraday cage on, scary. walk away, cross your fingers so that they don't fall over, and then hit go on your 25-minute sequence. Um, for um, monitoring I, vitals. Any any type of scans, Scott, or uh, something very precise like brain, uh, spine you mentioned? Pretty pretty typically in veterinary medicine, it's it's mostly restrained to neurological applications so brains and spines were the pretty much exclusively what we did on this scanner i think it's more or less still kind of the same nowadays more neuro more msk we're still not going towards the abdos and the cardiac that's still quite rare um but can you can you jump a few years to the future now where we are at the moment uh, what did change in terms of how you practice and and the train training of the radiographers that actually do veterinary medicine because I've had a few conversations in UK. I know you are in US, so it might be a little bit different. But here in UK, we I have the sense that there's not much 
dedicated training in terms of safety, for example. But we look at this picture and I cringe a little bit because there's no zone three there. There's no partition between you and the, and the scanner. But uh, jumping to these days, how do we go about in terms of training and uh, who actually does the scans nowadays? Is it the radiologist? Is it the vet doctor? Is you? Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? So after we did we decommissioned their scanner, we upgraded to a regular 1.5 Tesla. It's a nice, nicer GE. Uh, the way that we handle the training is all in-house. And I think that that's still very, very common. There are no restrictions in terms of what training you have to have to do veterinary MRI. So most often you'll find it'll be a vet tech from another department, either in radiology or in neurology. So they will get the two, three weeks worth of training that you get once you get a magnet installed. Okay. And then that's all they have to work with in terms of applications and safety completely. Um, so there's so, no dedicated training for safety at all? No. Wow. Yeah. Okay. No, so no, applica no. applications play a crucial role, essentially, uh, yeah. in the training process. Mm. Yeah. So at the hospital that I was working at, um, at the time, I developed all those things in-house. I made a training program. I made a safety program. I trained up all the vet techs from zero MR knowledge. Some had actually been scanning longer than me, but it was really an additive process for them because they had already been familiar with looking at the images and had a really good intuitive sense uh, of what's going on. But we just added in some of the physics. What what what, what about the spatial planes, Scott? This is something that I was wondering when I thought we're going to have this interview. I yeah. was always like kind of like fascinated about, you know, anatomy might change. So you might perhaps encounter different non-conventional plays like the the classic Ixil, Sagittal and Coronal. Uh, do you deal with that as well? Or is predominantly, you know, the, the spatial planes we are, the spatial planes we are used to even with uh, standard human beings? The the anatomical planes do change. So you it, you imagine the anatomical human figure, you know, standing up straight, arms by the sides. The anatomical dog is on all fours looking forward and you have different words for familiar planes. So instead of what we would think of as a coronal in the brain is actually an axial when it comes to veterinary medicine. Instead of a coronal, as we would think in the body, we would call that, you know, ventral dorsal um in, in that in that direction sagittal is sagittal in terms of the anatomy if you're really comfortable with cross-sectional imaging you can navigate your way around there are anatomical differences in terms of the number of vertebrae that you might see and um the brain's still pretty familiar you can, you, you can recognize all the large similar parts other than you know the ears look quite different where the spinal cord comes out is a different orientation. If you can imagine scanning somebody looking straight up toward the ceiling, that's kind of what you would be looking at. But what I was thinking is that you told me that you started immediately as a uh, like working in a kind of like a uh, bad context, right? So you didn't have that kind of reference. I mean, except for what you learn at school, but you didn't have that kind of reference by scanning a lot of human beings. So I would assume you had to start like by recognizing that specific anatomy as your reference, right? Or is something you have learned uh, again as yeah. application? Was that the kind of training? <laughs> Yeah, so the first the first imaging planes I learned were on dogs and cats. Wow. Um, luckily for me, I was 21 and I was an absolute sponge for everything. Every and I was really early on very very obsessive about learning MR. So anytime there was any downtime in the department, I spent all of that time, hours and hours any day for years reading physics papers because there really wasn't much available online like there is now where there's awesome YouTube channels, there's the stuff you guys are putting together. None of that was really around in like, I think I was doing this around 2014, 2015. There's the MRI in practice book, yeah. uh, MRI questions. And I just memorized that website. And then I would iteratively uh, go back and I would have a scan. I'd be like, all right, next, because every scan took eight hours. I'd be like, all right, next week, I'm going to, on the SAG T2, I'm going to change the echo train length. And it was like a big thing. And I'd be anticipating changing that one parameter next Tuesday. Um, 
that, cool. and that was kind of how you know, and the the anatomy just kind of came with that yeah. obsessive nature about it. What What do you prefer to scan uh, animals or humans? What's the main difference for you in terms of scanning animals or humans? Not the interaction, but scanning wise. Scanning wise, I really like veterinary scanning, and I really like cardiac scanning. And I feel that there is a way that there's a, there's a lot that those two share in terms of how the scan goes. To contrast it with scanning a brain or scanning a lumbar, you don't have to adapt anything to scan a brain and you can, you don't have to change much. You don't have to really be checked in to get through a brain quickly and effectively. If you want to scan a lumbar on a human, kind of the same deal, add your slices. You may need to change your field of view, probably don't. Uh, when it comes to cardiac scanning, every scan is totally different. You might get an arrhythmia. You have to adapt. You have different patient tolerances. Maybe they can't do so many breath holds. Maybe they can only do an expiratory breath hold for eight seconds, and then you have to know your pulse sequence in and out to adapt the parameters. Veterinary scanning is like that in the same sense that when you lay the patient on the table, there is a very clear reason why you're there. The problem is very open-ended. You could find anything at all it's usually in the, in the case of the spine it's usually going to be a herniated disc mm. that is so bad that there's neurological symptoms but that's not always the case you could find anything and you have to have your eye really attuned to pathology in a lot of different a lot of different aspects and keep your eye open for incidental findings or maybe you thought it was going to be back pain but it turns out there's a tumor in the muscle lateral to the spine and it's not neurologic maybe it's a psoas injury but you don't know that um, wow. so you can oh. you have to go in totally anything could happen you've got to be able to adapt and usually as the mr tech you're the point person for making images look good yeah. the radio, you, you work hand in hand with the with the doctors through this whole thing I have a curiosity about this, Scott, now that you make me think about it, because, I mean, you talk about the complexities as well of, you know, doing an MRI scan. And we saw that picture, obviously, now it's changing, but it's still an MRI scan. There is the sedation. There are a lot of steps involved uh, compared by scanning a human that sometimes, you know, it's just like lie down flat on the scan table. Off you go. So do you think that the applications of MRI could be much more widespread in the VAT context? But because of these complexities, perhaps like uh, there are other first line modalities like X-ray and ultrasound that are more commonly used. But in a you know perfect world where MRI is easy access, also like in a kind of like VAT environment, MRI mm -hmm. would be much more widely used and useful in this in this world as well. I think I think you're you're definitely right. MR is really valuable in veterinary medicine and there's so many applications for it. It has seen this huge growth in the last like 10 15 years. Despite that growth, it's still a very limited resource and it's a very hard resource for a hospital to get going in a lot of cases. There's a lot of limiting factors. There's more working against it than there are working for it. I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but it's. I, I look at it, again, kind of similar to cardiac MRI, where there's a lot that limits it in terms of the financial part, as well as the technical part. You want to open up a cardiac program, you've got to have some cardiologists that need to be familiar with cardiac MR and have hours to spend drawing circles. And then you need to get a radiologist on board to do the reading of all the things extra cardiac. And then you've got to convince an administrator that, oh no, we can't just have the new software package and training for techs and a radiologist sign on. We also have to have analysis software for reporting. That's another hundred grand. And there's a lot that limits it. In the veterinary context, it's the same. The scanner is very expensive. Human techs are very expensive. Um, and anytime that you might want to refer a patient for an MRI, there's no insurance to buffer it almost all the time. So you're asking someone to pay out of pocket for an MRI that maybe is going to work. And there's a lot of anatomy and pathology that we don't know what is normal because there hasn't been enough substantive research done on dogs and cats to say, oh yeah, HCM or DCM looks like this in a boxer when you do a cardiac MRI. No one's published that. 
Mm, wow. So, or same with, you but know, the lack of uh, there's yeah. a lack of information out there, basically. Yeah. And yeah. That hinders the job of radiologists or, or the actual tech that is running the, the scans. Yeah, that, yeah. that makes total sense. I was approached a while ago from one of the biggest companies in UK that is doing uh, veterinary work. And that was one of the concerns allied to the fact that there's not much training in terms of safety as well. Um, yeah. And techs normally, we have a problem with MRI safety in general, mm -hmm. uh, let alone on the vet world where there's a myriad of complications that comes from the fact that we're scanning someone that is not sentient in the fact in, in in the sense that they can tell you they they are in pain or they're not enjoying the scan they want to get out so uh, how do you normally deal with those situations where how do you know they're a cat a, a dog or let's say a reptile and what kind of animal you might have uh it's not comfortable in that scanner how how do you go about that and how you feel that the animals are not comfortable to have the scans because that's one of the big issues with burns for example in in the vet world it's it's pretty tough. Uh, not gonna lie, it's not easy. Pretty much all you have to work on is vital signs, and that's about it. I'm not aware, and this is likely the same issue that we have in human medicine, where there's probably way more incidents than we hear about because no one wants to report it because <laughs> it feels bad. Yeah. I'm not aware of any incidents that have been major in terms of safety you know, practices gone wrong in a veterinary context, though the environment is ripe for it. In regards to patients, the kinds of things that you run into are not so much getting hot, but when they're when the animals are under anesthesia, they kind of lose thermoregulatory capacities. They're very likely to get very cold. So you have to totally cover them up, you know, get them in bubble wrap, get them in blankets, get them in a, a, a warm shield there. And then tr maybe you can have a temperature probe, but probably not because ex MR conditional temperature probes are pretty expensive. Yeah, that's another problem, right? The the, yeah. equipment, yeah. the equipment for the animal, for the vet world, there's not many equipment available. They're actually MRI conditional. That's another issue that you guys might face, I would say. It is. And honestly, over the years, I've grown to actually prefer for the veterinary context as little in equipment as possible. MR conditional pumps are really annoying to deal with and they're very expensive when you are going to typically just have one to three drips. I think it's way more reliable and way more consistent if you just hang a bag and count the drips. Then you never have a problem or you get a waveguide installed at a bunch of extensions, get a pump that you're familiar with and is old and robust and then just run it through the waveguide and then completely avoid the issue of having MR conditional pump inside the room. Um, and it's same thing kind of goes with uh, pulse oximetry. You can, there's like these nicer uh, fiber optic guys you can have at the edge of the room. They've got a really long cable, stick it on the tongue. You can usually get a pretty good signal there. And you get heart rate in two places. EKGs is really the only yeah. sticking point where you kind of need some MR conditional equipment. But, I'm extremely impressed to be honest, Scott, with the, also the step that have been taken to provide good quality level of care uh, for animals as well. Uh, but I, I was thinking while you were talking, I was like, oh my God, I, this is like the evolution of this has definitely reached like a massive point. But at the same time, I was also thinking about the work that you have done about your personality and yourself, because I thought about myself getting this kind of opportunity and probably, I don't know, for the way, you know, I see dogs, I imagine that see them in a, you know, a moment they are suffering or anything like that. I would assume you need to do a massive work on yourself to avoid, you know, getting emotional and stuff like that. If I think about my Belgian Shepherd now, even the idea that might pass away one day, it makes me cry. If I watch yeah. a Chico now, I will cry straight away. <laughs> so I, how did you manage to change your personality in this? And I mean, not change your personality, but adapt to this context. It's funny, I, I I went in, I grew up with a dog and the dog was part of the family. Most people that work in veterinary medicine, a lot of them are the kinds of people that had inspiration strike them very fortunately for them at a very young age where they hit the age of 10 and they're like, I know what I wanna do. I'm gonna work with animals. And they have a vision and a goal really early on. I, I wasn't that kind of person. I fell into it 
And I learned to kind of work around that and have a different kind of perspective working with animals where it's sad to see them sick. And it's also really nice to be able to know that almost every MRI that we do, you can fix something about it. And it's almost always going to be better. And you have the opportunity to participate in that care, which is really nice. And often you see these animals for follow-up, which is not something I think that we get in human care very much, unless you work in something like radiation therapy, where you see the same patients uh, over and over again. Um, we would not infrequently do at least like repeat x-rays or repeat ultrasounds every once in a while, a repeat MRI. I, I think I would struggle as Julian, because uh, some patients that I see I resonate so much with their stories and having a pet and seeing the pet on the scanner and not knowing how they are feeling. I think it would be a little bit overwhelming as Julian is saying emotionally. I think I would struggle too. Um, but yeah, it, it's something that you need to do, of course. Yeah. Um, but on top of this that Julian was putting, how it goes about with the contrast? Because I saw that most of these scans are contrast scans. So you also have to cannulate those those animals, right? So you, you're looking at the cat that you love and, and the owner is around. Is the owner around all the time? Is not around all yeah. the time? Do you pre protect the owner emotionally so they don't see what you're doing with the animal? How, how that goes about as well? Yeah, in my experience, and I think this is common across a lot of places, we don't bring the owners back into the MRI yeah. area at all. It's usually better for that. In that case, a lot of the animals actually are easier to work with without the owners in those contexts. Uh, it's easier to sedate them. It's easier to get them kind of set up for the whole scan. They do need to have an IV, typically one or one to, one to two IVs, depending if we're going to do fluids or you know, fluids and additional medications. And then typically we'll just use the fluid line for uh, contrast studies. And, and you are totally correct. Pretty much every study is done with contrast, 90%. A lot of the reason for that is that it's an anesthesia procedure. We don't want to miss anything at all. You you don't cut any corners. It does, it does set you up on a road to overscan things in human medicine but it's the right thing to do in veterinary medicine, especially where the anatomy is so small, you know? So think about like, what's the biggest slice that you've ever scanned on a human that's like standard, like 2D on a liver might be like five, six millimeters on a single shot. Three millimeters is the thickest slice I have like ever used on a dog ever. That's three millimeters or less for everything. On a spine, on a sagittal, you might get one diagnostic slice two parasagittal slices to get a little bit of cord and like maybe you see the foramina and then here that's comes it. My question, Cross. Uh, here comes my question, Scott. How can you actually preserve a, like a good amount of uh, signal to noise ratio working with this, you know, tiny little slice thickness? You might you might lose a little bit of signal, no? Especially, you know, uh, to, it's probably for the coil, how the coil it is designed it, that the patient kind of like fit completely the coil so you might get more signal back maybe. It's a triple whammy, actually. You lose left and right. because So you're using human equipment, not designed for animals at all. So typically, if you're doing a spine, you're just using the spine coil, and that's it. And because it's small anatomy, you also need high resolution in addition to that thin slice. So a typical set of parameters in my mind for, say, a T2 sagittal on a beagle-sized dog, you might have a field of view of like 20, 24 centimeters, you need about 0.6 to 0.7 millimeters in plane resolution, three millimeter slice thickness, no gap, run a bandwidth. If you're on a GE, I think of it as like, you know, 31 kilohertz and four necks. Wow. It has to be, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of noise on it. Yeah. <laughs> no, though, that comes out looking really nice. Wow. You, drop it, uh, you drop that on any well, old I mean, GE scanner. Four necks is quite pumped up. If you think about it, that sometimes we run just one or two. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah, so definitely. You scan yeah. all your animals on prone, or you sometimes scan them uh, on supine position? Always dorsally recumbent, so that okay. the spine is right up against the table. Okay. You have them ventral, and I, I have worked with some veterinarians who prefer to do it ventral because there's some fear of if you put them under anesthesia and flip them around that you can twist some organs in the abdomen. I have never seen this in practice and the image quality 
hit that you take scanning ventrally is pretty bad. So dorsally recumbent, spine right on the table, you know, and usually I guess the, the other part of the triple whammy in terms of having human equipment for animals is that usually these are older scanners that you're working on and you have a very limited coil selection. So for years, the only coils we had were the spine coil built into the table and then two four channel flex coils. And that was it. And everything had to be done on that. Yeah, that, that's a big limitation. But I think there's some companies like Azaoto now that is coming out yeah. with uh, with some dedicated uh, scanners for veterinary work, which is awesome. Um, right. Yeah, I totally agree. Because yeah. as you're saying, there's there's more and more need for these kind of scans and, and we don't have the dedicated equipment or the dedicated training or the dedicated guidelines. So it's, yeah. it's a whole new field and we have to be very careful with it. Um, uh, exactly, exactly because of this, Samuel. That I think, I think Scott, did you mention that you were kind of like doing some kind of CMR studies on animals as well, or anything like that, or you have tried to do CMR studies? Did you mention anything like this, or did I did I dream about it? Yeah. So I, because I was really obsessive about MRI when I got into it, and then we got the new scanner and we had upgraded all of the veterinarians. You know, it's primarily neurology and radiology that own the scanner in any location, or it's just one or the other. Sometimes there's private neurological practices and they'll own a scanner and send out to a radiologist sometimes. But um, any patient that ends up on the table is there for a neurologic reason. I always kept my eyes peeled for any kind of incidentaloma. And if I saw something in the abdomen, I would be pretty liable to call up the neurologist and be like, hey, there's some stuff in the abdomen. I know you're going to order a CT, but what if I got you some cool stuff in addition? And I got the okay a lot of times. So I would, tr and I felt it was always additive to the study to have, have located it and have imaged it thoroughly enough that at least when the dog goes for a CT inevitably later, it can be a focused study. Um, I have done a little bit of cardiac as well. Again, chasing incidental lomas. Uh, always keeping in mind that it's anesthesia time. So anytime I spend having fun making pictures is, you know, could be impactful to the client's bill at the end. So, you know, you never go, you never go crazy yeah. with it. Only keep to something that will be additive to the study. Absolutely. You were but, telling yeah. about a, a story on the backstage of a dog that you scanned for Nero and you then went to the cardiac side of it can you tell us that story for for the public to actually understand how it goes when when you're mentioning that you do those uh, sequences sometimes so there was a case a handful of years back i believe it was a bulldog um and we had been scanning him for again a neurologic reason and on the sagittal i noticed some pericardial effusion and what I thought was going to be a mass on one of the parasagittal slices. So I quickly kind of pulled the table out, got a coil across the chest, got some EKGs on, swapped them, you know, so we were watching the EKGs on the scanner EKG. And in between waiting for answers from the neurologist in terms of where to proceed neurologically, you know, got some cardiac scans, a couple of short axis cines. You know, we were going to do pre and post anyway, so I got some... T1 gradient echo 2Ds just oh. ripping through the thorax really quick. The whole and, lot. <laughs> yeah, it, they, they came out pretty nice. <laughs> and they did end up being additive to the study in that this dog was afterwards imaged in echo. And because the tumor went all the way to the way basal side of the heart, it was kind of a bigger, thicker dog. They weren't able to assess the atria very well like on the outside and on the MR images, you can see that the tumor had adhered to the atrial wall. So that piece of information would have been kind of lost to yes. echo and we gained it on the MRI. That well, awesome. yeah. sounds so interesting, to be honest. And congratulations, <laughs> to be honest, because, you know, sometimes be a technologist, be a radiographer, you need to be able to think Think about out of the box. Say, say that is crucial. Then that's that's the right approach, to be honest. And I think probably I can see why you know also it is so exciting working you know in a bad context because you you might be facing this kind of challenges that might be probably just be less common than usual when you just do kind of like very repetitive type of scans. 
Yeah, that's why after, so I did, I was in the animal hospital for eight to 10 years. And when I went to human medicine and made the jump, finally, I would have a really hard time working somewhere where, you know, the kind of culture around scanning was don't touch the parameters, don't ever change the field of view. <laughs> Classic. That would be, I have, I have done too many years of scanning that type of way and always having my eye on anatomy, always having my eye on pathology and adapting the scan to get the best pictures as fast as I could to, to, you know, wow, it's just what they prescribe. <laughs> I set it up on a hit go. Yeah. To do anything else. Huh? <laughs> and you know, there's, there's definitely that, that culture, I think in a lot of, in a lot of places, do you, do you, I don't fit well into it. Do you normally do CMR scans on, um, on a like common basis also like normal patients well what are, what are you doing at the moment i think you mentioned it at the beginning are you are you working as a cmr technologist you said yes at the moment my full-time position is working in a cmr lab so we just do cardiac that's it it's a mixture of clinical cases and research cases oh that's cool interesting that's awesome absolutely you, you miss yeah. the animals i do i do i try to get scanning veterinarily whenever i can um, I, I, I do quite enjoy it. Uh, on occasion, I have also done some consulting for veterinary work. So it's great. If, you know, I've, I've met a lot of vets as they've kind of come through the hospital, started as, as, you know, young interns, and then they go through residency and then open up a practice later and may remember, oh, there was that guy who was really obsessive about MR and tried to get me <laughs> out and scan a bunch of fruit. And I might get a call two years from now and I'm super happy to go, you know, try to optimize, set up the protocols as best as I can. And I'll work one-on-one -on -one with the, the vet techs and try to train them from the ground up to scan. So it, just so I can understand, there's no dedicated vet, vet techs, right? They're just human techs that went to the veterinary world and start learning and scan, or there's a course actually for veterinary MRI. There's really not much of anything. So the state of it, it, the typical process is it'll be a veterinary tech already, someone who's right in, at least in the US, yeah. someone who's probably probably registered as a CVT, certified vet technologist, yeah. and then they will be trained up on the job. But that background in education is more equivalent to nursing school. So you can imagine like taking a nurse, dropping them in an MR department, giving them no background and saying, you scan now. Yeah. That's the thing I have here in UK from the conversations I had with technicians here, vet techs and owners of veterinary uh, clinics was exactly the same thing, that there's no dedicated training for those people, yeah. not only in terms of safety, but actually scanning. And and there's there's no guidelines. The, that's something that worries me. Uh, me and Julian, we are everything MRI. We, we think about all aspects of MRI and veterinary is, is one of the aspects in MRI. And, and I think that's very worrying. We already battle a lot with problems with the regulations in the the, MR, the human side. Yeah. Uh, seeing the veterinary world like that, it, it scares me a little bit as well. <laughs> I think for, yeah. nice for anyone listening, I think there might be some individual experiences which might you know Absolutely. contribute to this discussion. So I think if anyone wants to share in the comments, I think it would be great to be honest because I think that is the only way to understand a little bit more where the, the truth lies at the moment if you know there is anyone that has learned anything from a dedicated course if there are a dedicated course that we might not be aware there might be so, so yeah perhaps each individual experience might be different at this stage exactly for what you said sam that at the moment there is not such regulation so yeah, so yeah absolutely i would i would love to see it in the next 10 to 15 years really be a growth in specialization of the vet techs you know, I, there's definitely practices that have tried to work around this by bringing in human techs. And you still, it, it's not like you can drop a human tech into a veterinary scanner and then they thrive. It doesn't tend to be the case a lot of the time either. It Because that culture of MR that we have sometimes it is is sort of, you know, you you do a lumbar spine and you immediately think of, oh, I do my axials here, here, and here. And then I do a sag and there's a T1, T2 stir. And that's not always the case in veterinary imaging. It's the, you know, the mindset is very different. So there's been yeah. plenty of times where I've encountered human techs not thriving in veterinary medicine, you know, in, in the same kind of way there, there would need to be training for humans as well. 
mm. or human text rather. But you know, the vet the vet tech industry moving more towards specialization would be so great. There's so many vet techs that I've worked with that are interested and really want it, want these resources and have the right mindset because they've already been doing x-rays. They've already been assisting with ultrasounds. They already have a pretty holistic radiology experience if they're that interested kind of tech. Scott, this is a winner opportunity for us to work with you and try to developing something like that, either guidelines or or a training course maybe for vets, uh, for radiographers that are doing veterinary work. I think there's a window of opportunity for us to to touch that market as well. Um, but yeah, I would love to collaborate with you or, and other people that I've been talking to in the US and here in UK. I think it's very important to do that work. I wanted to ask you one thing as well. You mentioned remote scanning. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, have to say, I have to say, not because... Obviously, Samuel is my partner. I was aware that you're also like quite interested about remote scanning. I think this is a very nice window because I think I would love to hear, guys, your thoughts. Samuel, to be honest, and again, I'm not saying because we work together, I believe he's probably one of the most uh, experts in this field in terms of remote scanning. And I understand also why there is a lot of attraction at the moment and interest in this topic but i would like to know your perspective i know some of perspective already but i would like to know your perspective scott also combining your background as a vet technologist you mm -hmm. know imagining the future world of you know scanning animals remotely see what do you think about this it was amazing amazing topic to be honest I, I love remote scanning. I love I love remote scanning. I love what it can do. I think there's a lot of really good applications for it, especially where there's such a dearth, such a lack of trained people available in so many different geographies that it can open up a lot of opportunity for practices, for care, for techs, for training. Um, yeah, and get training. And I love what you guys have where you're trying to foster this community of like text talking to text, you know, it reminds me of a, a more distant version of, you know, being able to sit at the scanner and be like, hey, man, when you do your stirs, what do you keep the TE at? <laughs> you, know, you get someone who's been scanning for 50 years and has a really strong opinion on it, read a bunch of books. I, I love I love that. I think that that open sharing of information um, is awesome. And I think remote scanning really enables a lot of that. That being said, the execution of remote scanning for humans and, and animals I think is closer than it is further apart. There's a lot of the same concerns. A couple of the caveats being that, you know, there's got to be so much more, so many more hands on deck to do a veterinary scan because of the anesthesia. So anyone who's going to be doing the anesthesia inherently has to be MR safety trained. They have to be trained enough in addition to that to be able to get them on the table, place the coils appropriately, position them appropriately, landmark the scanner, and then be familiar enough with the equipment that you, as a remote scanner, can phone into them and say, hey, we need to do a hard restart. Let me tell you where to go in the back of the room, look for the big emo reset button. Um, so I get, you know, and that's kind of an extra thing to have to know when you're remote scanning is, you know, what does the back room look like on a lot of scanners? How do you troubleshoot a lot of things? Um, you know, so you've got an old Siemens, the table's not moving anymore, and you've got to be able to walk whoever's there through all of that. So I, I, I agree with you, Scott, 100%, because the, the remote scanning part of the VET MRI would be easy to implement, like you doing the scan from home, that would be fine. But as you were saying, the community is already struggling with the training and the knowledge of scanning animals and then the safety of it as well. So I, th I think we're not there yet for the veterinary world because if there's no infrastructure, we wouldn't be able to take the only person that knows about the safety and the scanning out of that position and leave the, the veterinary and the nurse and the anesthetic people there to do the rest of the work. So that's my point of view. I don't know what yeah. you feel about it. I, you, you've done remote scanning before, I, I believe. That's my understanding. Um, yeah. How was that? How, how did you feel when you were doing that? There is a lot of trust that is, that is, I guess, required and that you can feel helpless at times. You know, you really want to hope that everyone that you're working with on the other site, maybe across the country, maybe somewhere else, maybe two towns over, that 
they have a good MR safety infrastructure in their hospital, and that there's also been at least one or two individuals who have taken the reins on it. I, I think having buy-in from all the interested parties is really important, but also having having someone that holds other people accountable yep. to MR safety standards that also is interested and holds themselves to those same kind of standards. Because if something goes wrong in your remote scanning, you are you are kind of helpless in that sense. So I guess you know one of the things on, on how it gets executed that's important is having as many contacts as possible at whatever location you're going to be scanning at. Yeah. For a veterinary case, imagine that a dog wakes up and there's a code or it's this forward from the anesthesia and it's aggressive and it's trying to jump off the table and there's only one person there. They're not going to come out of the room to call you and let you know that the dog woke up. They're going to be inside the room yeah. with a flailing animal and then either you're helpless or you have hopefully a list of contacts that you can call say, hey, so-and-so needs help in the MR department. ASAP, send somebody down. Yeah, that, um, that's where I was. I was saying. I think it's it's we have to wait a little bit to be actually safe in a veterinary environment, yeah. or to feel safe to do this kind of uh, remote scanning. As you're saying, trust is the most important thing there uh, on your colleagues and on the processes and policies that you set up. But I feel we are still a little bit far away from that reality uh, because I think we need to fix the problems from the bottom down, as we normally say in everything MRI. Uh, and I believe if we don't have that training and those guidelines in place, it's going to be very hard to start implementing new technologies in general. Uh, but that's my point of view. And thank you so much for sharing yours. I don't know what Julian thinks about this. No, but... I agree. Yeah. I just want to kind of like end, end this kind of specific section of the conversation by saying that how my grandma used to say, one problem at the time. And this is the best solution. Let's address one yeah. thing at a time. And I'm pretty sure that we'll, we'll reach that point for sure. I mean, it's going very fast. Uh, Some will can testify this. Obviously, it's getting definitely spread worldwide. Uh, I'm pretty sure th this will touch base at some point also in the vet world. But yeah, I would say definitely one thing at a time. We'll definitely touch base on that as well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think you're, I think you're totally right. That infrastructure needs to be there. It'd be great if there was some open resource that everybody could just grab. When you buy a new magnet and you're a veterinarian, let's build, it. Oh, let's some, build that. Here's some standards. <laughs> let's try to build something like that. I think it would be very interesting for sure. Even for us, everything MRI, I think would be interesting. Uh, we want to tap everything that is MRI. And as you said, and very well, we are building the community where we are radiographers to radiographers. And I think that's the most important thing. So we can relate with stories like yours, uh, which are fascinating the way you went from from that scanner that we showed on the on the beginning to now working on cardiac scans and and do cardiac nine to five basically every day and doing remote scan on the side so it's fascinating to to see these kind of careers developing and we want to bring these kind of stories <clears throat> sorry to our community as well so they can relate and see oh there's more than just doing this for the rest of my life uh, Julian is taking a career path that is amazing. I'm taking another career path. You have another career path. So there's a lot of things that we can do. Um, so we're reaching more or less the time of our of our interview. I don't know if Julian wants to add anything or ask more no, questions. To be honest, it, it was lovely. Would it be so nice to have you on our studio for a complete yes. podcast session? But uh, probably, I you know, if you're popping, you know, to London, we can arrange that for like a full episode. Perhaps we can also divide it in two parts completely guideline on a bad MRI would be fantastic. But thank you so much for today. It was, it was uh, absolutely amazing. Thank you. It's been really lovely to talk to you guys. Is there anything you want to add, like publications you're doing, any projects and anything that you would like to point uh, our community towards in terms of learning from, from you or from many other people in the vet world? Uh, anything that you want to mention? I love talking shop. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, I am working on trying to, I've done, like I mentioned earlier, I have done some consulting. I do have a, a business, practicalmr.com that I'm looking to grow a little bit as well, where I you know, have worked with veterinarians, would love to work with some human sites as well, setting up, expanding cardiac services, protocol development, training, you know, that's sort of in the works as well. So, you know, feel free to reach out. We'll put your contacts in the in the bottom uh, on our YouTube description of the video so everyone can reach you out and have these kind of conversations with you. I know you like to talk as well, and, and that's something that we enjoy 
share these kind of ideas and I believe you will be interested to to help more people around around the world as well. I have a few people that would love to talk to you for sure. Great. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you for today. Thank you, everybody.